just give um, give a little bit of background about our organization in case anyone is unfamiliar. Uh, so this panel is being hosted by the North American section of the uh, Society for Conservation Biology, which is a global nonprofit organization. Um, as a group, we aim to bring together conservationists both in research and in practice to build a um, professional community and to help facilitate success in conservation. Um, so one of the ways that we do that, that we try to bring people together is by holding conferences every two years. And our next one is less than a month away at this point, which is crazy to think about. Um, so this is the North American Congress for Conservation Biology. Um, it's being held in Vancouver. It's from June uh, 23rd to 28th. And I'll put all this information in the chat in a little bit. So these conferences are really uh, excellent opportunities to hear more about the latest developments in the field um, and also to network in a professional setting, um, especially for students and early career folks. Um, one of the best things about the conferences, in, in my opinion, is really the diversity of topics that get covered there. Um, there's a lot of conservation biology, but there's also um, policy and sociology and economics and psychology and even the arts. Um, anything that really can relate to the science and practice of conservation is really represented at NACCB. So it's a really good conference uh, if you haven't been before. Um, and one of the reasons why we're holding the panel discussions right now when we are in May is so that they can hopefully start to sort of initiate some of the professional networking that can take place at the conference. Um, some of the panelists that you'll be hearing from today will actually be attending the conference themselves. So there might be some opportunities to reconnect with those individuals there um, and continue these conversations in person. Um, so to try to facilitate the connection between these panels and the conference, um, we have arranged for anyone who's here at these panels to receive the discounted um, early bird conference registration rates. So uh, just gonna briefly turn it over to Bernie to explain how that would work for anybody who is interested. Thank you, Anna. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here today. The uh, I really wanted to go through the process of the early bird registration. Super simple. If you have not yet registered for NACCB and you want to after today's panel, just send me an email uh, stating that you're going to be registering and then go through the registration form, select your registration category. But before you check out, uh, I will be able to go in and manually add the discount to your registration so that you only pay for the early bird rates. So super easy. You just have to send me an email and I'll include my email in a chat in a little bit so that you can uh, communicate as needed. Thank you. Cool. Thanks, Bernie. Um, all right. So at this point, I'd like to go ahead and get the discussion started. Um, I'll have the panelists introduce themselves in just a moment. But um, before I do that, I'd like to just set some sort of basic ground rules for the discussion. Uh, we will be taking questions from the audience posted in the chat. Uh, there's also one question that was pre-submitted through our Google form. Um, I would just ask that everybody try to stick to sort of broad general questions and avoid asking for advice on really specific individual situations. So this is only an hour, it's gonna go really quickly. So we're just trying to keep it um, sort of broadly relevant for as many people as possible. All right, so let's turn it over to um, our panelists. I'll let you go ahead and introduce yourselves in, in whatever order uh, feels right. Um, if you could just let us know who you are, um, what you do, what you do in your current role, and then maybe just briefly how you got to where you are. Whoever wants to go first. I'll go. <laughs> uh, hi, everyone. I'm, I'm Rita Gupta. I'm a, a research scientist at Microsoft's AI for Good lab, where I focus on using artificial intelligence and data science to advance biodiversity conservation specifically, but sustainability goals in general, um, by partnering with a lot of external uh, collaborators in academia, um, the nonprofit sector, and in uh, other, other companies, um, and also government agencies. Um, so uh, prior to that, I completed my PhD at uh, Georgia Tech in the College of Computing in 2021, and then went to work at a nonprofit called Conservation Science Partners for uh, a couple years as a data scientist before taking on my role at Microsoft. <laughs> uh, 
I can jump in next. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Peter Chaurier. Um, I'm, uh, I work with Wildlife Conservation Society Canada. Um, and uh, Canada is where, where I'm based, based in Ottawa, Ontario, um, and did my schooling here as well. Um, I, uh, yeah, at WCS Canada, I work as a key biodiversity area assessment and outreach coordinator. So I work with our key biodiversity area team who are identifying important places for nature uh, across the across the country um, as part of this global program for identifying uh, key biodiversity areas. Um, I've been here about two and a half, almost three years, I guess now. Um, and for then I completed my PhD at the University of Ottawa, uh, looking at impacts of climate change on, on pollinators, especially bumblebees and butterflies. Um, I also did a lot of work on community science there and, and science communication. Um, and so all those things kind of blend together in the current role that I'm in at the moment. Um, yeah, I, uh, I guess that's all for me. Uh, I'll also be at NACCB, so I'll say that at the beginning. And if anyone wants to email me to meet up there or, or uh, chat in person, uh, very happy to, to connect with people there too. I'll be happy to go next because I also have a WCS connection. I'm not at the moment though, an old one. I'm Allison Ormsby with Adventure Scientists. Uh, the organization is a nonprofit based in Bozeman, Montana but I'm based in Asheville, North Carolina. And our nonprofit uses a citizen science model to collect data at large scales on conservation issues. Um, I think I'm the oldest one on the panel. So I'll go briefly over career highlights. Um, I did the Peace Corps in West Africa. I've done a Fulbright in India. My PhD is in environmental studies. I research people park interactions in Madagascar been a journalist with the UN. I worked with the WC, with WCS at the Bronx Zoo and also in Papua New Guinea. And then I taught as a university professor in environmental studies for 20 years. And now here I am at Adventure Scientist. So happy to talk about any of those things. Love traveling. I'll also be in Vancouver with a um, booth. So come, come visit our Adventure Scientist booth. Great, I can round this out. So um, great to meet everyone. My name is Mike Chang. I'm the director of equity at Cascadia Consulting Group. And so um, we, our main offices, we have offices in um, Seattle, Washington and Oakland, California, um, but I live in Tacoma, Washington. So about 45 minutes um, south of Seattle. Um, a lot of what I do is really kind of at the intersection of environmental equity and justice with kind of climate vulnerability assessments and adaptation planning kind of with and for community groups. And so we work with primarily public sector clients, so cities, um, counties, tribal governments, state and federal agencies on how do we um, prepare for, assess climate risks, and, um, uh, and strategically implement uh, measures that might improve um, adaptive capacity to cope with some uh, of those climate risks. Um, kind of, a, I have spanned a lot of different types of organizations. I um, did uh, my graduate school education. I got a master's from the University of Washington and kind of uh, had a social science training. So did a lot on perceptions of things like marine and renewable energy and fisheries management. And so uh, initially got started in the field working um, in the fisheries side of things. Um, and then uh, about 10 years ago, as uh, ocean acidification phenomenon and the impacts of OA became bigger, began studying the impacts of ocean acidification on marine resources and kind of made the slow transition into the current job that I have today um, in the climate space. So um, yeah, so it's really excited to be here. All right, great. Thank you very much. Um, really excited to get this going and start getting some of the people's questions answered. Um, we'll start with, probably start with the one that was submitted uh, online in advance and then we can start, oh, there's just was another one that came in. Okay. Um, well, for the first one, uh, how would you suggest building a strong resume and CV if you don't have a lot of experience? So anybody who wants to speak to that, go for it. <laughs> I can talk about that um, since I mentored college students for 20 years. Um, I, I think people undersell themselves sometimes and you can put any 
experience on your resume, even if you weren't paid, right? So you should count all your unpaid experience um, and you could put it under a heading called environmental experience. And it could be internships, it could be volunteering, it, you should include your language skills um, and be honest about, you know, are you proficient or conversational? Don't, don't claim fluency if you're not. Um, other skills like GIS, if you got a certificate, you could also talk about that. So I think um, sometimes people do skills-based resumes, but there's lots of uh, interesting parts of your personality that could come through on the resume that you might be overlooking. Yeah, I think that I'll just build off that. I think that's some really terrific advice as well. And one of the things I noticed just kind of building off that too is like highlighting those uh, skills that you might have learned in classes as well, whether it's in like an undergrad or whatever. But like GIS is a great one where if you've taken a GIS course in, in university or one or two, like, you know, that's a great thing to highlight on that resume and kind of, you know, you can detail maybe some of that depth of experience that you have. And again, being kind of transparent about, you know, you weren't using it in a professional setting necessarily, but, you know, highlighting that uh, relevant course for session. Yeah, great, uh, great, great point there, Allison, yeah. Yeah, I might jump in too. I would say, again, kind of echoing the other two panelists, what Peter and Allison said, um, oftentimes, especially for entry-level jobs, we actually focus on people who just recently graduated. And so we really embrace kind of like, again, um, not... Uh, fluffing your resume, especially if it, um, in a way, but really focusing on like the transferable skills um, and all of the things they said, whether it's skills you picked up in classes, extracurriculars, volunteer experience, internships. One of the other things that I also um, say is really focus on um, whenever I review cover letters and resumes, um, I treat it as a writing sample too. And so oftentimes, especially when folks are really established in the field, their cover letters and resumes can um, feel a little bit, um, can be a little bit sloppy or can be kind of like, because they think that their experience is what sells them. But whenever I'm reviewing them, I'm just kind of uh, what I evaluate is like, these are writing samples that you're giving me. And so really focusing on kind of that presentation, that conciseness, are you able to communicate why you think you are qualified for the job um, is just as important because there's been people who have been super qualified, but then they give me a cover letter that's just bullet points. And I'm just like, okay, but uh, do I want to like give the opportunity to this person who just didn't even write in complete sentences with a person maybe with less experience, but is able to package themselves um, better. So that's one of the other things I would add. And I might just add um, to try to identify people, maybe like but we're in classes with you who have gone on to do things that seem interesting and just like be open to reaching out for a chat. I know it can sometimes be intimidating, especially if you're not that close to these people, but they're people who are kind of starting out the same place as you and might be exploring opportunities that would be of interest to you. Or maybe you'll learn that actually maybe that's not for you and you want to. So just talking to your peers and also the people around you um, can really like help you kind of build a, a map of the world that you're going out into and, and feel a little bit more, yeah, like have more faith in your own background and experiences to sell them uh, and portray them properly. Uh, so yeah, just talk to more people. All right, that's great. Thanks, everybody. Um, so Catherine asked a question in the chat about volunteering, which I think we've we've kind of touched on a little bit, but I just wanted to check. Uh, and I know Allison answered it in the chat as well. Uh, if anybody else wants to add anything about volunteering, anything additional, or I'll move on to Dale's question. Okay. All right. Well. Um, Dale wanted to know, for people with PhDs, what was the biggest challenge you found going from academia to the NGO sector? Um, and what advice do you have for that transition? I'm happy to, I'm happy to kick off, I guess, because um, it feels like it was you know, pretty recently for me that, um, that I made that transition. Uh, I think one of the biggest things that um, I think there are two big things that really like uh, that I noticed come making that transition from from academia into the NGO sector and just having like a 
real people job, quote unquote, um, which was, uh, I think the biggest was that like the work is a much different nature of like in a PhD, everything is kind of entirely dependent on, on you, um, or most things are, I felt, at least for mine. Um, whereas in the, you know, when I started to work with an NGO, you start to depend on a lot of people a lot more, uh, and it matters a lot less, you know, in a PhD, you have this, you, have, uh, you know, sometimes getting these bad habits of putting in all these huge hours and, and working these insane, uh, insane amounts of time. And, you know, you can kind of see that pay off because things depend on you, but in the NGO space, that doesn't always, that isn't always the case. You can spend a lot of time working for really long hours. Um, and at the end of the day, you're kind of limited by other people in a different way. So, you know, it's much more important and, and feasible to have like a really great work-life balance. Um, and so I think, you know, that was something that in the early, it took me a little while to adjust to is just like adjusting to the fact that like, you know, in a lot of places that, you know, hopefully you're expected to have a good work-life balance and, and things are set up for you to, um, to, you know, to live that way in a long kind of sustainable way. It's also, you know, in a PhD, you know, it's, it's four or five or six or however many years, but, you know, a career is like, is going to be the rest of your life. So a lot more important to take that kind of marathon approach and, you know, approach things slowly and, uh, and more uh, sustainably. Um, and the other thing I would, the other kind of big challenge that I found was, uh, with like project management and things, um, it's a lot more important in the NGO space, I feel, because there's, you know, you tend to be juggling a lot of projects that are, you know, maybe smaller in scope and whatnot, but, uh, you know, being able to juggle that management aspect and managing your time and, and kind of where you're focusing, uh, is, is really important and not something that I think academia prepared prepares most people very well for um there's definitely ways to seek that out and i think that's you know if you're partway through your phd i definitely uh you know start to think about ways you can kind of uh up those those project management skills and just start to think of that in advance because it you know pays off in the phd if you do learn it and then and you know orders of magnitude as well and in the career later on too I can answer that NGO academia question too. I was in, I worked for two NGOs before I got my PhD, then I worked for another one afterwards. Um, and like Peter said, I, I can't stress enough how the culture of different NGOs is different. So um, I think work-life balance is really important. And I think um, it's actually hard to achieve. And so I think it's worth, you're researching the nonprofits as much as, as they're researching you when you apply. So you should ask around, um, you know, like Amrita said, you should talk to people, network, ask around, find out the reputations of the different organizations, intern with some of them, volunteer with some of them. Um, yeah, and the culture is completely different than academia, like couldn't be any more different. So, you know, in academia, you're striving for tenure or you're getting your PhD or self-directed with your committee. And then um, in nonprofits, the size of the nonprofits matters, the budget what kind of hierarchy they have, where the scope of work is, what kind of benefits they offer. It's just, um, it's just so different. I may also jump in. While I don't have a PhD, um, I think in terms of Dale's question, um, one thing that I know uh, many of my peers and colleagues who've gone on to get PhDs and make the transition from academia to non-academia jobs. One thing is kind of um, fellowships can be a really important tool to kind of like break out of academia. So um, uh, a lot of folks that I know um, have done fellowships through different societies or different consortiums like the Sea Grant fellowships have been um, really important to kind of get some of that um, applied uh, experience. Um, and then I think the other thing, because um, I've also hired people from academia, one thing that I also say is that uh, at least in the private sector, we really focus, when we do resume reviews, we want to review a one to two page resume. We don't want to review an eight to 10 page CV. <laughs> and so I think um, what's really important is kind of being able to um, how do you represent yourself uh, when you have less real estate um, to submit? And so I think um, 
what people have worked with career coaches, people have worked with mentors, whether they've been previous advisors or close peers that they have within the field, um, being able to kind of condense that full CV into a one to two page resume um, is important to kind of um, make that jump. And I'll just add that I threw a couple of links into the chat for kind of some resources or directories that I know of that are a little bit biased maybe towards conservation tech jobs, just because that's my um, that's my area. But they're kind of running lists and uh, Wild Labs is actually a really nice community of people that get together to talk about um, projects, collaborations, but also job postings and opportunities. Um, so there's just a couple of things that might be helpful uh, for browsing. I saw, I also, I saw Dale's comment there. Uh, I think they, it sounds like they meant more about in terms of getting the job in the first place too. Um, so I'm, I'm Rita, I guess you read that and those things are perfect there. Um, and I think I would just add as well, like one of the big things that I did when I started looking for the job was uh, obviously following like different NGOs or, you know, different conservation groups that I thought were interesting on uh, like LinkedIn and stuff like that to see like when they started posting jobs but even visiting their websites like most places will have uh you know a job section or opportunities on their website as well and you know it's not super efficient but it's a good procrastination technique on a friday or you know at the end of the week uh to just kind of visit these websites pretty regularly and check in because they they advertise them but you know even from experience it's hard sometimes to get those those job uh, applications out in a wide net so worth kind of checking often and and, uh, and regularly with uh with any groups you're you're interested in working in or with, sorry. All right, great. So I think a lot of the questions are are running into a lot of the same topics. So we might be getting some uh some common themes going here, which is totally fine. Um but I want to get to Miles' question. As a recent graduate with a bachelor's degree in environmental science, what is the best first step I should take to prepare for a career in environmental research? I feel like we need more information. Environmental research is too broad. Like, do you like animals? Do you like plants? Do you want to do microscopic, genetics, forensics? What kind of research? Um, yeah, I was thinking, um, namely with uh, soils, soil science. Yeah. Well, talk to some earth scientists, <laughs> which I think we're not, but um, USGS or um, any earth science associations, that's something I would recommend to everybody. Oh, shout out for SCB. Um, everybody should join a, a professional organization. And, and if you're still a student, get a student membership when it's cheaper, but mm -hmm. figure out an association in your area. For me, SCB is my favorite. Um, and I wasn't even that, you know. I just did that on my own. Um, but, you know, if you like soil, find the soil org. Or if you like geography or some kind of wildlife or fungi, you know, find a, a professional organization. It's kind of what Peter was saying. Like, you need to start following these organizations. Get on their newsletter, whatever. Follow their social media. So, uh, Miles, I, we could have a side chat and I can connect you with some earth scientists I know. Okay. Thanks. I'd appreciate it. Yeah. And I might um, add on to that, Miles. I think um, one of the, uh, my first job out of my undergraduate, I actually um, connected with a, uh, different faculty members and just got a job as a research tech um, at the same university I graduated from. Um, and I worked there for a couple of years after I graduated. And that gave me kind of a lot of the hands-on kind of like research foundations. Um, it also made me realize that when I did end up applying to graduate school, I didn't want to apply to a scientific <laughs> graduate program. And it was definitely more in the applied social sciences and policy space. And so I think that was really, really informative in shaping the career direction I went into. Um, I would also suggest, right, I think there's a lot of organizations, including um, state and federal agencies when they do have job applications directly meant for recent college graduates. I know the EPA, they do this annually. They hire, like the requirement is you need to have graduated in the past six to 12 months. Um, and so if you 
graduated in 2022, you would already be disqualified for that because they really want to hire those recent graduates. So I would just make sure you have um, every couple of weeks if you just want to search USA jobs, because many agencies um, do have those types of jobs really directed for those recent graduates um, as um, training opportunities. So thank you. I just want to add that if you are considering um, a research career and you're thinking about going to grad school soon or later, um, just like whenever you do make the choice about which program you're going into, be really sure about that choice because it makes a world of a difference to feel like you're spending five to eight years at home versus five to eight years in a place that, I don't know, is a bit of a struggle or not the best fit. So whatever leads you to the, the point where you feel confident about identifying a program or faculty mem members who seem really cool to work with that you've reached out to and talked to or you know a little bit about mm -hmm. their area, that's the point when you like want to make the decision about which program to apply to. And, and you probably at that point already kind of have been like preparing to be a good candidate for them. So you'll be in a good spot, but yes, choose wisely if you go to grad school. Okay. Thanks. All right. I'd like to move on to Sabrina's question. Um, or so Sierra's question. Uh, what are some of the benefits of working in a nonprofit organization or consulting and what are some common challenges and frustrations that people might face in this sector? I um, may jump in. So I've had kind of been at a variety of different institutions. So I've been in a university extension. I've worked at um, a large nonprofit. I've worked for a tribal government and now I am in private consulting. <laughs> so I have kind of spanned all the different types of institutions. I think, um, uh, you know, I think there's actually a lot of similarities between nonprofit work and private consulting. Um, there is a lot of really, um, with nonprofits, oftentimes we're responsive to grants we may receive, um, uh, our funding that we may receive as an organization. And similarly in private consulting, we are responsive to things like RFPs or RFQs that provide us funding to do work. And so there's actually a lot of like similarities in terms of like the business models between nonprofits and consulting. Um, I think uh, some of the considerations um, uh, benefits both, I think um, there's, I always say there's pros and cons of every single job. And so there's, if you're like, oh, I need to find the perfect job that is like satisfies all my needs. Um, it might be out there, but um, it's probably really uh, the unicorn job. And so I think one of the things I always like think about is um, try a lot of different organizations out and kind of get a feeling of what may feel right for you um, in terms of your values, in terms of how you work and your working style. I think for me, um, when I was working at a nonprofit, I worked for the Nature Conservancy. And so it was a very large nonprofit that was like in and of itself a huge bureaucracy. And so I think there was some like things that I wanted to do that I didn't quite, I wasn't quite able to do because of those like bureaucratic um, processes that were in place. Um, whereas in private consulting, I work for Cascadia. So we're a very small firm. We're about 80 people right now based across two offices. And within private consulting, I think that there's a lot of like flexibility and how we do work and how we show up for communities that we serve and work for. And so I appreciate that nimbleness <laughs> that wasn't quite afforded in a large nonprofit. That being said, right, I haven't worked for small nonprofits, so small nonprofits may offer the other nimble, that kind of like nimbleness and flexibility in how you do work. Um, yeah, so I think, again, there's pros and cons of each, but I really am an advocate for kind of getting that diversity of experiences, seeing what types of organizations fit your values, your work style, your approach, your philosophy, um, and getting that uh, so you can get into the industry or the type of work that you want to do. I'll add just a little bit to what Mike said. Um, I agree about benefits, right? So you need to make like a little spreadsheet 
and um, put, you know, so those factors in there. What are the benefits, the pay and, you know, 401k or time off, overtime, comp time, um, and then mission. So what is the mission of the organization or the private consulting firm? Do, do ethics matter to you? Um, like, is that, do you have a really strong ethical core or you're like, whatever, I don't care. I'm getting paid well, it's okay. So um, I would I would do like a real deep thinking exercise about um, all of those different factors, um, including overtime or professional development benefits. Like, do they support you going to a conference once a year or taking a class? So there's more than meets the eye usually. Um, and it's worth, again, talking to lots of people to, to figure out if it aligns with you or not. There's nothing else to add to this question. I can pull one from that was um, submitted online. If we're ready to move on. Okay. All right. So this one, I'm I'm paraphrasing this a little bit and making it a little bit broader. So this person has a lot of, uh, they have a PhD. They have a lot of experience, research experience with a species specifically that does not reside in the U.S., but they're now at a stage looking for a long-term position here in the U.S. Um, so wondering how do they transfer their knowledge of and in this case, behavioral ecology, but I think you could apply it to, you know, different kinds of different kinds of science uh, from an animal that's, you know, not in this country um, to a hands on job with an ecosystem or an animal that does exist in this country. Maybe I'll start and see if anyone else has to say. I would say focus on transferable skills. Um, I think even though what you have studied is not a species that um, is in North America, what you probably do have is a set of research skills, critical thinking skills, um, grant and project management skills that are probably pretty applicable across a variety of different types of jobs. And so I think, again, kind of when I look through um, application materials, I don't, for me, I don't really focus on um, your research topic or what you actually studied. I really focus on what are the, um, what are the skill sets that you can bring that can be applied to what I'm hiring for or looking for? And so I think, um, yeah, I would focus on those um, really transferable skills because you probably have a lot of the skill sets that um, people, uh, if you are trying to get a job in the US or in North America that they would be hiring for anyways. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. And I just highlight as well, like, you know, even things like survey methods or methodologies, um, you know, that's a great example of something that like, you know, might not be the same species, but you might have similar methods for others. Um, also, like thinking about like the how the species kind of transfer, whether there's, you know, a taxonomic group that is, it, is present in North America or, or the country, or even like, you know, if you're working on lions, you know, large carnivores is something that we have here, right? That, you know, that's a, an element of trying to transfer that. Um, and make that a more, uh, yeah, a, a more localized uh, example of, uh, of what you've been working with. All right, so I want to go to uh, Juliana's question, and we did talk about this a little bit uh, earlier, but maybe we can kind of circle back and, and give a little bit more on the subject. Uh, just kind of generally speaking, uh, picking graduate programs, either a master's or a PhD, um, what are you looking for in terms of, if you're a prospective student, what are you looking for in the program? I could answer that. Um, so I already put in the chat that everybody should join ResearchGate. I, I really like it. Um, it's a way for you to get articles directly from um, academics, often for free. Um, and it's a kind of like a LinkedIn of academia. So for graduate school, first of all, master's versus PhD is super different. So you'd wanna think about, do you wanna spend two years in the US or one year abroad getting a master's or four to seven years in the US or three to five abroad getting a PhD? 
do you want to go into academia and teaching? Then get the PhD. If you don't, you don't really need a PhD. Just get a master's. Um, do you want to get funding or not? Everybody wants funding. So you need to take time to search out the funding sources. You need to reach out to probably five to 10 faculty members who might be your advisor and see if they actually respond and then find an awesome faculty advisor. And then they're going to have some money for you and you need to ask them for money. So you could be their research assistant, which is an RA, or their teaching assistant, which is a TA. You might teach lab sections. You might help with research. Um, so you're actually kind of doing an interview process to find the right university for you with the right subspecialty and advisor that you actually like and who's going to be an advocate for you. So you need to spend at least a year researching schools, um, but maybe more because the funding cycles sometimes are only once a year. So happy to talk more on the side about that. I would add, I would just add on as well one small thing, which which Allison touched on, which was just like the importance of finding the right supervisor as well. That's that's really awesome. Like that's a really, especially if you're doing a, a you know graduate school in in North America, and the timelines tend to be much longer, two years for a master's, and you know five or six, seven years for a PhD. Uh, really important to find someone that you know you'll get along with through that whole time, uh, and that you know you know you'll have a good experience with. So really important once you've narrowed it down from that you know five to ten into like you know, two or three or whatever. Really important to talk to students who have been in that lab before and, and try to get some kind of external opinions on, you know, how have, how have other students' experiences been? Because you don't want to, you know, it sucks to kind of get two years in and realize, oh man, I can't stand this person and I have to finish another three years with them. So really important to, to figure that out. Yeah. Okay. And go, go uh, ahead. Yeah. One more thing um, that I had a mentor of mine um, tell me when I was thinking about uh, graduate school and whether I should go for a master's or a PhD, one of the things that um, they told me was like, look at what the alumni are doing now, um, because that can give you a sense about the job prospects or the opportunities about what types of jobs the alumni get after graduating from that program. And so I think that can give you a sense of like, the, um, uh, if you want to go in a specific direction or a field or an industry, for example, if you want to go into public service and work for a government agency, but then you see a lot of the graduates go into academia or private sector, maybe you should like, um, that might be an indication that may prompt some questions about why the graduates are going into these fields, but not these fields. Um, and, and it can very vary based off of the program but i think seeing where alumni end up can get a good sense of like the types of skills and jobs that um the program prepares you for and then i have one more tip about talking to people um so if you're currently still in school or you know you probably are in some classes where you have tas who are graduate students um, like Allison mentioned. And those are people who kind of, because it's now their job to kind of learn the landscape of research, they're kind of starting to form patterns in their minds about which which departments or which universities kind of specialize in different topics really well. Um, and so this might differ from kind of specialization to specialization, but those are also people who like you have access to and who you could probably ask like, hey, um, what's your research about? Or like, what's another department that you thought about going to? Or like, cause they're just a little bit closer to that, like having made the choice of which program and why, but you know, they'll have kind of impressions they can give you uh, from their searches for other, or what they're learning about work coming out of other institutions. All right, so there've been a couple of questions in the chat that, um... There's been a little bit of conversation in the chat about it, but I thought we could just address it um, out loud, maybe in a little bit more detail. And since there've been a few on the same on the same theme, I'll just kind of summarize. Um, essentially, um, when employers are looking at your experience on your CV, can you compare sort of the value of hands-on job experience versus experience you might have gotten as part of school, so through graduate research or an internship through your through your school? How much does that matter?
I can start and maybe this might inspire um, others. Um, I think my perspective is um, it's about how you frame and message your experience. Um, it uh, again, kind of like whether someone could have a lot of different jobs, but if they're not able to um, communicate why their set of experience makes them a best fit for the skills or the risk job responsibilities that I'm hiring for, um, I might uh, go for someone who may have less work experience, but are able to communicate why their um, coursework or why their volunteer experience really prepares them for the job. And so I think it's really about, this is why I think it's really important, like um, things like the cover letter. Um, I read every single cover letter <laughs> because it could, I use it as a writing sample. It's kind of like I can evaluate um, the strength of you as a writer, as a communicator, um, um, and especially communicating how your set of experiences can best um, align with um, the skill sets or the responsibilities that I'm hiring for. So I think um, there's, so that, I don't know if that answers the question directly about like what is more preferable because the answer is like, it depends, um, but it, it really depends on how you uh, frame your experience relevant to what I'm hiring for. So, and this is why I also just say, don't copy and paste um, cover letters from job description to job description because people are reading it on the other end. <laughs> and so it's really easy to tell when someone has kind of uh, just copied a cover letter from another job and tailor and then just like swapped out the company name because you're just kind of like, oh, this is so generic. It's not actually telling me anything. So, yeah. I'll agree with all that. I put some more transferable skills in the chat. So I think um, as Mike was saying, your cover letter and your CV or resume, they tell your story, right? It's kind of a narrative about you. You're presenting yourself. And nowadays it's quite competitive out there and you wanna be unique. Um, how are you gonna be memorable? What's special about you? And that's why the cover letter kind of has to tell a little story. Um, and it has to prove that you actually researched the organization or the company. Um, and then if you have experience in undergrad, say you did a summer research project or something, that's fabulous. But that's really not quite enough. Um, so you want to show that you, I mean, over time, you're going to work longer at a place and you don't want to be jumping from place to place every year. That, that sort of tells a negative story. Um, and you want to explain if you've supervised anybody. Did you work as a team? Did you supervise somebody? Were you in charge of a budget? Did you do the research design? So all of those skills should come through. And whether it was at in a class for a research project in university or in a paid job setting, um, make sure that you're portraying that correctly. So I, I, I personally like when people have life experience um, and it might not even be totally related. Maybe you worked at a like equestrian center or obviously um, at a restaurant or something. And sometimes that, that shows that you're more well-rounded and maybe you paid your way through school. That's also I mean, that's something to be proud of. You did that. So um, it's good to be well-rounded. All right. If there's nothing further to add on that question, I can take Elizabeth. You have your hands up. Yeah, I just sort of wanted to uh, piggyback off that with a question. So <clears throat> I guess part of the question I had about transferable skills and getting that to come across is the things that you're saying right now, I can't picture what that looks like on a resume because the way that I tr communicate those things on a CV is to say grants, awards, and fellowships. And then I just list whatever these are. Um, so what are these categories? What does this look like? How is it designed? It just looks so different that at the start of it, it looks like I did nothing for 10 years. <laughs> I would just take some time to just, I don't know, grants, awards, and fellowships, just as sections, if they're included with anything under them, tells me immediately that you know how to write proposals, so you know how to plan work, 
you got them done, like, because you probably had to report on the grant that you got. So you had to manage a budget. So just that section itself kind of communicates a lot more of that context. So like some of that story is already coming through, whether you really see it or not, maybe you're in the weeds of editing your resume or your CV, but I think that's a great start. Okay, so having sections like project management, that's not necessary. There is still some like reading between the lines that can happen here. Yes. Okay. You would only do project management if you were doing a skills-based um, resume, which I find to be a little clunky, actually. It's more a businessy kind okay. of thing, I think. But I think um, do, don't just list the fellowship and assume people know what it is. Say what year you got it, how much money it was, and what it was for. Like, was there a project title? Give us the project title. Tell us briefly what you did. Like, did you count salamanders for six months or and again, that helps tell the story. Um, so yeah, give a little bit more okay. detail. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. One other thing I would say, um, one thing that I actually found helpful, I went to, um, I guess this was about 10 years ago. I went to an AGU conference as I was coming out of, um, like making a job transition. And so it was an AGU conference and they actually had like um, career coaches at the conference that were free to use and you could just bring your CV um, and they could, and you could, and you had your own objective. So if you came and just being like, here's my academic CV, I need help transferring it into like a more applied professional resume that's one to two pages. Um, they are really, really key. And actually, one of my close colleagues who came from um, academia into private consulting, she did something very, very similar. And um, she said it was a very humbling experience because <laughs> her entire CV was just kind of uh, torn apart and reorganized by um, this career coach that she met through one of these professional society conferences. And she said it was really, really helpful about like how for her to learn on um, how to like prepare a resume for non-academic jobs, yeah. How could one maybe find a person like that by but not going through some, you know, a conference or a seminar or something like that? I, um, good question. I think, um, if you are still affiliated with university, um, probably reaching out to if there's a career center that's available for um, uh, students, staff, faculty um, is probably where I would start. All Every university you all have attended, the career center should be open to you for the rest of your life, right? You're an alum of some somewhere and they should be available. People are also really nice, right? So if you're on LinkedIn and you're linking with somebody who, and you're like, I really like your job. Will you look at my resume? They probably will. Yeah. All right. Um, if there's nothing more to add on that, I have a question of my own. Uh, I would also like to say, if you asked a question earlier in the chat and you need more information or it hasn't been addressed yet, please just go ahead and send it again. Um, and we'll try to get back to, we've got about 10 minutes left. Um, so my question is for those of you who have been in academia at some point, um, which is probably all of you, but um, can you kind of, and now you've moved into NGO or private sector or sorry, nonprofit, can you kind of compare sort of the, I guess like the cultural differences or the <laughs> the life differences between academia and outside? I can't since I'm still sort of detoxing from academia. Um, the, I mean, the tenure system is um, unique, right? So if you're in academia, you've heard par uh, publish or perish. Every school is different. So some schools are teaching focused and so they're not so obsessed with publications. Um, I will say the whole publication landscape is changing or has changed and the whole like pay to publish. I have feelings about that. Um, but yeah, the tenure, the, the, um, I think kind of like what Peter was saying about when you're in academia, you're you're working all the time, right? You're never off. You're working. Um, you're grading papers. You're preparing lectures. 
you're helping students. It never ends, right? And um, in the nonprofit world, hopefully, if you have good work-life balance, you actually work 40 hours a week or something like that, or you at least get overtime or comp time or some kind of, some recognition and some holidays. Um, I will say the academic calendar though is, is pretty fabulous. So, um, so there's all these um, trade-offs, but yeah, the culture is, is radically different, I would say. I think I, think I would add that, sorry, um, no, I'll make it quick. Um, from the student's perspective, I think that um, academia was a really, a really nice place because it's almost, it's entirely set up for you to be learning as you're working on your research. Um, and then so transitioning to a nonprofit job or a private sector job, you're still maybe encouraged to learn, hopefully encouraged to learn. My team definitely has like a, you know, constant growth mindset kind of thing. Um, but you also have a lot more constraints and responsibilities. So some of that support might feel like it left. <laughs> it's still there. It just takes a little bit more looking for, I think. So that's just something that I've kind of experienced since I still remember academia and it was really tough and yes, work all the time. Um, but there was kind of like a lot of built in support for that, for that time when you go into the workforce, it seems just like, oh, like this is your job and you kind of need to execute on it and you'll have hopefully a good mentor, but sometimes you have to like try really hard to maintain and build, continue to build your mentor network so that you can get that support. It's just a little bit more active. Yeah, that's, that's really great. That's really great advice. Um, I, I think like one of the things kind of related to that, that, that I think is a big change is uh, the lack of kind of like goalposts as well. Um, in academia, you're kind of, as a student, you're kind of set up where, you know, you have different check-in points with your thesis committee every year. You have like, you know, papers you're working towards and there's like really consistent and obvious goalposts that you're working towards. Whatever. Whereas, uh, you know, when you move into the NGO space or, or most other careers, you kind of lose that and it can be a lot harder to kind of, you know, you have to just deliberately kind of structure your mindset and kind of frame yourself, I think, to, um, you know, to account for that and, and figure out your own personal goalposts and milestones that you want to work towards. Um, so I think that's a really important one, kind of building off what Amrita said. Um, and I think generally what, what I was going to add was uh, kind of getting out of that student mindset in general a little bit or kind of moving where, you know, and in academia, as a student, you're often in this kind of, you're with your cohort uh, or you're with folks who are, you know, uh, kind of in a more concretely elevated hierarchy, hierarchy position kind of above you. Um, whereas, you know, in the workplace, that's not, that's not true. You know, you might have your colleague who's been here 20 years and you're kind of, you know, you're working beside them doing the same job or something. So I think it's important to kind of step out of that. Like, you know, now you're, you're a professional and, you know, you, you might feel imposter syndrome and all these things most people do for sure. Um, but, you know, you're a professional and like, you know, you've bamboozled your way into this like job and now like fake it till you make it. And uh, I think it's important to try to like keep that in mind as well of like you're in a different place than you were as a student and like, you know, you deserve respect and like people should should get out to you as well. And, uh, and yeah. Um, I was, I'm going to make a pivot because I also see Juliana had a question about addressing gap years or kind of like gaps in CVs. And I think, um, uh, one thing, um, to connect actually to one of my prior things is about, it doesn't matter. One of the things is like, how do you frame your experience and how do you communicate why your experience makes you a good fit for the job. We, a few years ago, we actually hired someone in a kind of a communications public um, affairs role. And the person that we ended up hiring, she was kind of in this phase where she was like, I think I want to go to graduate school, but I don't know what. And so she also kind of actually took up some time to think about what her next step was. But during that time, she actually, um, just to kind of pay the bills, took a job as a customer service representative <laughs> for like a travel tourist company. And so even though we're really much in the environmental conservation climate change space and she was working for like 
a cus like a customer representative for like a large travel um, company. She was able, in the end, she decided not to go to graduate school. She applied for a job and then she really communicated um, why her job as a customer sales or customer service rep could prepare her for being able to be in this like communication, community facing role, uh, talking about a variety of topics like climate change, climate adaptation, um, things, because that's what she actually had to do in her customer um, service role is talk about a lot of like technical policies that the company had and communicated to customers in a friendly and uh, timely manner. And so anyways, I think it was actually interesting because like her gap year that she was thinking about taking um, about like going to grad school or not ended up being like the real foundational experience that actually got her her job in our firm. So anyways, I would just think like there's always opportunity. And so taking gap years is great. It allows time to reflect. Um, if you do have other jobs, again, that put those on your resume. And again, if you're able to communicate the relevant skills for other things, whether you're applying for graduate school, you're applying for fellowships or reaching out to faculty, or you decide not to go to school and go into the field, um, there's a lot of benefit that uh, that you can. And again, it's about communicating um, relevant and transferable experience. All right. Well, thank you very much, everybody. It is exactly three o'clock. So once again, we <laughs> wrapped up just at the hour, which is wonderful. Um, if anybody has any final comments or anything, now's a, now's a good time. Otherwise, we can wrap this up. But um, I really want to thank our panelists. This was, this was great. Lots of, good, uh, lots of good comments, lots of good advice. Um, and thanks to everybody for coming. <laughs> Thanks for having me. I also wanted to, I forgot to plug that I'll also be at NACB. So if you see me there, feel free to, or reach out, I'll uh, share my email as well. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks Thank everyone. You. And best Thank of luck to everybody as well. Oh, before folks leave, I did want to plug something in as well. Um, Anna, we are developing a, men a networking session during NHCCB as well. Yes. Uh, so information on that will be up on our uh, program soon. Um, so that's a, a very clear opportunity for anyone here who's attending NHCCB to just come and talk with a bunch of cool folks that are part of our organization. Including, I believe, Allison. I'll be there. Yeah. Yay. Thank yeah. you, Bernie and Anna, for organizing this. It's so great. Oh, this is all Anna. Yeah. Thank you. Well, <laughs> it's cool. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for attending. That it, glad that it came, yeah. came together. <laughs> yeah. Good idea. Okay. Take care, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Nice Thanks. to meet you all. Nice to meet you.